afternoon. Uh, thank you all for your presence. Thanks to Sofia and Vladimir for organizing this webinar with the Federation. Before starting, I would like, of course, to express to you, Sofia and Vladimir, our solidarity with the Ukrainian nation, with the Ukrainian educational community, and of course, in particular, with the students, teachers, uh, and all the staff of the Catholic University from Lviv. We all know that uh, your town has been bombed in recent days, and we have a special thought for you two and your families, of course. Sofia is Vice Rector for Strategic Development at the Ukrainian Catholic University, founding Dean and Chairman of the Supervisory Board of Lviv Business School at UCEU, and also Member Board of the European Federation of Catholic Universities. Vladimir serves as Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Ukrainian Catholic University. He is also a Director of the UCEU International Institute for Ethics and Contemporary Issues, and together with uh, Sofia and Vladimir, we would like to look into the current situation in Ukraine and learn how it is addressed by the only Catholic university in the region. The Ukrainian Catholic University's response to the war was uh, manifold, is manifold and holistic, and thanks to you, we will learn about what it takes to lead a Catholic university through the war time. You can also tell us how concretely and intellectually you expect support from the Catholic universities that the Federation brings together. So thank you very much uh, for your presence and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you very much for your um, very kind introduction. It's, uh, it, it's, it's both pleasure and honor to be with you um, tonight. Um, I'll begin first and then uh, Sophia will follow and um, we'd be happy to um, have your answers, uh, have your questions uh, and hopefully our answers um, uh, after that. <clears throat> I'm, I'm uh, in Lviv now on the campus of uh, Ukraine Catholic University. And uh, thank you very much for your um, solidarity and for your um, uh, prayers as we are going through this um, challenging, um, challenging time. Uh, well, since our title is Leading a Catholic University Through the Wartime, let me start with a thought on leadership. Well, leadership, from my own experience, has to have two wings to be able to fly. Firstly, it is about defining what is the right thing to do and what is the noble thing to strive for. Secondly, it is about being able to personally witness about what is right and novel by serving your people. In what follows, I'd like to share with you some of my reflections and observations, which I hope will provide some helpful context in thinking about the Catholic universities and Catholic universities partnership now and in the future. Putin was bluntly clear in publicly voicing his argument for February 24, massive and full-scale invasion in Ukraine. Well, the president of 160 million Russians has proclaimed that Ukraine, the country of 40 million people, is a non-existent entity, a sort of a historical illusion. This illusion is populated with the Ukrainians who, as he claims, have no right to exist. This is why in his own eyes, he has the right to military fix a given geopolitical anomaly, which is Ukraine. The most recent sociology in Russia tells us that a vast majority of Russian people, more than 86%, are happy with this view and support the war against Ukraine. According to Putin's plan, Ukraine was supposed to be overtaken in three days, followed by a swift change of the present political leadership and installment of a puppet government in Kyiv. This plan has monumentally failed. With every new day of the Ukrainian resistance, there is a growing confidence of our victory among Ukrainians and internationally. The war has triggered massive demographical shifts and moves in Ukraine. As of today, we have 7.7 .7 million internally displaced persons and 4.6 million refugees who left the country predominantly to Europe. The total number of the displaced Ukrainians more than 12 million is greater than the population of say Austria or Sweden or Portugal or Greece or Belgium. And most likely we haven't reached the maximum numbers yet. 
for the sake of an argument, imagine that say every Belgian citizen has left the country within a month. So that Belgium is an empty and 100% depopulated space. What sounds like a thought experiment in case of Belgium is a painful and brutal reality in Ukraine. The Russian army proved to be incapable of delivering a military success as it was envisaged and became instead fully and massively engaged in the war crimes and acts of genocide against Ukrainian people. Russian atrocities and horrific acts are widely documented these days throughout the cities, towns, and villages which were freed by the Ukrainian army in the northern part of Ukraine. Recently, I was asked by one of the foreign journalists whether and how UCU as a university was preparing itself for the war. Well, my first emotionally loaded reaction was that I wish no university professor or a manager ever asks himself or herself this kind of a question. And yet a few seconds later, I realized that I should rather say the opposite. Namely, I wish every university asked itself this question. What would you do just in case there is a war in your country or in your neighboring country or somewhere far away if there is a real far away in the world of today? I had read recently in one of the Bloomberg's publications that CEOs of the large multinational corporations have, swift, have switched their mode of thinking from just-in-time production to just-in-case situations after the war exploded. So just-in-case thinking is very much characteristic of our present situation at Ukraine Catholic University. There are way too many uncertainties with which we have to live, to operate, and to make our decisions. I wish there were more of this just-in-case thinking among the universities in Ukraine and internationally before the war exploded. I wish our universities, speaking of the Catholic universities, had asked themselves individually, but most importantly, as the largest global body of the universities, what is our plan A and B, just in case the war outburst somewhere, say in Ukraine? So whenever so just in case arrives, we have certain systems and models in place to start acting immediately. It's not only this though, the moment you ask yourself such just a just in case question, you would also feel compelled to start thinking in terms of preventing the worst from happening. What is now happening in Ukraine isn't a matter of just days, weeks, or even months. The war and the genocide which Ukraine is subjected to during the last 54 days has had a long incubation and cultivation period of at least 22 years. It took 22 years for Putin and Russia to launch the major war affair in Europe since the Second World War II. Uh, a few generations of Russian people were participating in cultivation of, um, of the Russian world architecture which was clearly becoming more and more intolerant, aggressive, toxic, and war-friendly. Think of Georgia, Moldova, Belarus, annexation of Crimea. As a matter of fact, it's obvious that the Russian universities were a part of this massive effort for many years in a row, and still are as the Russian war in Ukraine falls. Will they be back to think Will they be able to think and act differently after this war is over? What if they do, what if they do not? I believe there is more than 1,500 Catholic universities worldwide. An incredible network with an amazing potential and shared mission and vision for the future. A network which should be capable of imagining and defining the future. We, the universities, are in a generational business, if I can put it this way, meaning that we produce the most lasting and cross-generational impacts, perhaps the most important and transformative impacts 
when it comes to human personalities, human lives, social and community lives. One thing which we can allow ourselves to fail at communicating and educating is as simple as this. A free society is a moral achievement. A moral achievement which cannot be achieved just once and for all and stay forever. It requires everyone's effort and commitment. It's a kind of moral victory which is expected of everyone and all of us at all times. In essence, this is what unfolds itself in Ukraine now. It's a moral combat for freedom and dignity. And this is why our moral victory of, is of such importance for Ukraine, for Europe, and for the world. We as the university community are in this combat. This is the right time for us to be authentically follow our mission in standing for what is true, good, and holy. This is the source of our resilience and the hope for the future. One of the most important things, which I believe we should be collaborative as an impressive international network is this. We should share our responsibility for designing and nurturing our regional and global security philosophy and infrastructure. Security resides within the personal relationships foremost. Well, whenever security doesn't feel secure, it's because we succeeded in corrupting our relationships. This is why I'm convinced our future also badly needs a new ethical infrastructure as well as a solidarity infrastructure. All three contours of the ethical, solidarity, and security infrastructures are beginning to reveal themselves amidst the blood, pain, and suffering of the war. I conclude with this. We all readily acknowledge that the best way to walk through the Lent in time is by practicing fasting, prayer, and work of charity. This is all very true indeed. And yet, I just can't avoid thinking and praying for thousands of Ukrainians who went through this Lent overwhelmed with suffering, pain, brutality, torture, and loss of the most beloved. For thousands of my fellow Ukrainians, this land has become a journey towards their ultimate sacrifice. It was their way of imitating following Jesus. In times we all embrace by Easter, we are all embraced by Easter passions, mystery, and glory. So let me uh, stop at this. Uh, thank you. And I'll um, give a word um, to Sophia now. Thank you very much. Uh, well, today on our calendar, it is a day 54. This is exactly how we calculate and how we how our calendars look like since February 24th. And uh, if you ask any Ukrainian what date it is or which day of the week it is, they might be confused, but they, but they definitely remember what day of the war it is. So in next 10 minutes, I would like to talk about three things. Uh, since in normal life, I am um, more related to business and my background is in business, I would like to share a bit uh, what's the, what is the economic situation in Ukraine. Uh, second, I would like to talk about what does it mean for education in Ukraine and for our university? And third, how does Russia's war challenge Catholic universities globally? So according to the various estimates, our economy is ruined between um, 500 billion and $1 trillion. This is just in five, six weeks. The recent report of World Bank is that our economy is down 45%. And of course, it will take years to, to rebuild even if everything starts stops right now. Uh, it will take probably up to two years just to demine the territories where active war happens. And um, again, it will, it will take so much time even if everything stops today. Well, Demir already mentioned so, some numbers about uh, uh, how many people left their homes. Um, there are more than 8,000 kilometers of roads which are destroyed. And if you think this is the distance between 
Alaska and Florida, uh, about of the same length. Um, uh, 10 million Ukrainians have fled their homes, more than 4 million refugees in other countries. I'm one of those um, refugees with my kids and half of those refugees are children. So it's mostly women and, and children. There are 7 million internally displaced people and 40%, uh, most of them are not working at the moment. And there are 40% of Ukrainian families saying that they have saving for just one more month only. Well, unfortunately uh, for business, this is also a huge challenge because 60% of businesses, according to some data, were not able to relocate. So everybody were, everyone was talking about war, but I think deeply, no one of us believed that uh, what happens could happen in, in 2022 and in Ukraine. Um, at the same time, despite of these devastations, people are practicing incredible resilience and hope and belief. Uh, some businesses are working from the bomb shelters and are growing their operations. So about 15% are saying that their operation grew indeed. Every third company is looking for expert opportunities. And uh, about half of the companies are right now working on new products and services. So they had to look completely differently at what they do, how they do, where they do it, do it. And this is completely changed, you know, in not only in the minds, but this is physical change for people. Um, all those numbers are very important and especially they're important if you think about us as an academic institution, uh, which has which has commitment to teach and to educate and would like to keep this commitment in the next academic year. So how does the education landscape look like um, in Ukraine right now? The Ministry of Education launched the interactive map, which you can uh, take a look at. It's called safeschools.in.ua. And according to the data from this map right now, 976 educational institutions are damaged in the country and 95 are totally destroyed. So we are talking not only about, we are talking uh, about schools and universities. Uh, the number of universities in need of evacuation and relocation can increase in the future. But right now there are about 10 of such. Uh, in the regions which received internally displaced people, uh, like Lviv, for example, where Uku is situated, uh, preschools, secondary schools, and university dormitories uh, have become, um, are, are serving as shelters for people who, for, temp uh, for, for temporary accommodation of people. Um, also, many institutions became more uh, reminding logistics center and hubs for collecting, sorting, and distributing humanitarian aid, uh, while school buses are used for evacuation. All of this applies to UKU as well. So from the first day, our students volunteer, help, support. We host refugees, we prepare food, we collect and distribute humanitarian aid. In the first month of war, UKU collected and distributed 1.2 million US dollars for humanitarian aid. We produce information campaigns, collect uh, evidence of crimes and boycott activities of companies in Russia. This is all our students do. But we also teach. I think now we teach in a very different way. Uh, service learning became our uh, main tool. Uh, but I also would like to say that young people uh, need great help and support to reflect on difficult journey they all of them are on. About 15% of our students are abroad. Some of them took emergency mobility programs, but most study online at UKU. Uh, we also invited students from Suma State University to join our courses, um, as this is one of the universities uh, which, which is uh, located in the zone of active war. UKU has created three scenarios for our future. And we have an overall understanding what we will be doing as an institution in each of them. But at the same time, when we look at our mission and our commitment, you know, um, I think 
as overall as a nation, we go through deep, deep transformation at the moment. And as an educational institution, I think our role will be crucial in the future uh, in such two directions. First, to rethink everything that happens to us as a nation, and second, to contribute to the rebuilding of the country. Um, in last 54 days, we became much stronger, both on organizational and personal level, as probably all of us were doing things we never expected of ourselves. Uh, we saw true values of people, because when you have a war, you don't really have uh, gray. You usually see black and white and uh, how people live, what values they practice, you can see very, very quickly. Um, unfortunately, we also saw a lot of dysfunctions in the bureaucratic systems and international organizations. And this is what I would like to mention about the role of Catholic education in the future. Uh, war in Ukraine um, is a time for both great leadership and mediocrity. And unfortunately, we saw quite a lot of mediocr mediocrity uh, recently. When decisions are not bold enough, when, um, when um, people on leadership positions in various countries and uh, in various continents continents are over promising but not but under delivering and i think the role of catholic universities in developing true leadership with character in, and commit and commitment is even more important now and i think what we live through in ukraine uh, is something we would like to learn from but we also hope that other countries and other nations will also learn from us crisis bring up something very special in people more humanity. Uh, we can see people who were competing with each other recently become together. Uh, they help each other. We see a lot of people who were uh, more quiet and uh, maybe less uh, visible become very, very engaged. And uh, we also would like to appeal to Catholic education to support people in Ukraine and help us protect vital things which are taken for granted very often in many countries, like human dignity, freedom of speech, civil society, free market, and even private property. There are many concerns. What if the situation engages more countries? What if uh, there is more military weapons given to Ukraine? What if, what if, many more what if. But I would like you also to consider one what if. What if Ukraine loses? I think in that case, everybody in the free world will lose. Um, if Ukraine loses to Russia, such scenes which we have seen in Bucha, Irpin, Borodyanka, small towns near Kyiv, with killing, raping, and stealing, they might happen in many more places. Or in Mariupol, what we see, a city which is almost of the size of, of Lviv, where we are situated which is completely bl blocked and destroyed. Um, and those scenes, they show that, um, show how evil can have power. But, you know, silence sometimes can be also evil. And we kindly ask you not to be silent and to support um, Ukrainians in, in our fight and, and ag actually in the fight, not only for ourselves, but in the fight for all free society. Thank you. Thank you, Sofia. Thank you, uh, Vladimir, for your comments and uh, thoughts about uh, this um, situation that we know in Ukraine. Um, it's time for the questions. So if some of our colleagues has, have some questions for you, it's uh, the moment. Okay, my name is Elena Hoffman. Hello. 
Hello. Do you hear us? Yes, yes you, you hear me. Okay. Um, I am from Germany, Catholic University of Applied Sciences, North Rhine-Westphalia. We placed an Erasmus uh, application for Key Action 107 in 2020. I'm trying to uh, maintain contact with our with the, the person, the academic who visited our uh, International Congress in 2019. And uh, the question is, what can we do for you? What do you expect? Or, well, what, what is, what can we do? Because I can pass it on to my rector and um, to the academics uh, whom I will meet, but what do you, what do you expect? I remember there was one call or a concept launched by the head of the international office in the beginning of the war, like um, describing um, the um, amount of, um, of, of scholarships for students, for PhD students after the victory. But well, victory is um, not right ahead of us uh, to be realistic. What do you need? What do you need from us? This is my thank question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a great question. Uh, well, yeah, victory is, uh, uh, it will come. We don't know when, but um, uh, we also look at the, actually, we look at this, uh, at this statement, it's still relevant for us. And it, it, it even more becomes relevant for us because we don't know how the academic year will look like next, you know, in 22, 23. So we are planning, we are talking to many institutions, as many as possible, that um, um, they help us with, uh, with scholarships for the students. Uh, uh, we actually, uh, not, only in, not only in Ukraine, but also abroad, so that we can send some of the students, because uh, even more, we believe that they need to have proper education, they need to have the student life, uh, volunteering and fighting is, is important to the country, but at the same time, we need them to be educated. So um, the, this call for the solidarity network is still, it's, it's open. We are talking with different institutions and if your institution can help us with that, we would be eager and uh, to talk about that and discuss for which programs it's the best fit. Uh, for uh, partnership in which areas is the best fit. And um, this is the work which we continue and would like to continue. If I may, if I may add, uh, just kind of very quickly, I think that these days uh, uh, Ukraine has become a hub of, um, international, uh, of international solidarity. And, and we are indeed very happy and grateful for, for this. I think it's also very important for us and to, uh, to think um, about the future. And I think that future uh, will also be very, very much international. And, um, and this is why um, uh, one of our kind of very important requests um, to the international um, university community and to the Catholic universities is about uh, uh, kind of helping and supporting us kind of to rebuild uh, uh, the country after the war. So there is, um, there is certainly like a, a brain drain movement uh, these days for very obvious uh, uh, and objective reasons. And at some point, I mean, that moment's got to be reversed. And I think that with your help and with your support, we should be able to reverse that kind of moment so that, um, that the energy and brains and expertise will flow into Ukraine. I mean, to rebuild that country. And there's going to be a lot of work for uh, you know, five or maybe even 10 years. Thank you. Stefan, I, I see your hand. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Vladimir and, and Sophia, thank you for sharing your experiences. It's, on the one hand, it's completely horrifying to think that, you know, we're on a webinar and you're joining from a city uh, under attack. Uh, and, and it, but it makes it real. Uh, so thank you for sharing. I, I was going to ask the question that Helene had asked, and, and I think uh, the, the answer is, is important. And, and on behalf of our Vice Chancellor, we will make contact how we can support directly. Um, but I wonder what we can do collectively uh, 
Um, uh, the, the Pope has been active in his condemnation of, of the Russian president. And I wonder if there's something that collectively through the strength of each of our institutions, we can do to not just support uh, Ukrainian Catholic University, but to, to support the calls for peace, to, to bring the victory that Sophia talked about, and then to support the reconstruction that Vladimir talked about. So maybe it's as much a question for IFCU um, about what we can do collectively through strength in our numbers, but again, can I please say thank you and, and know that we are thinking with you and standing with you. Thank you. Um, 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 well, I think that uh, what, is, what is really very important is, um, is, um, um, is kind of sharing and spreading information uh, about the situation. Um, I think that uh, what is also very important somehow is kind of letting this uh, the, this the spirit of solidarity to grow further and further. And as as I mentioned in the, in my kind in my presentation, I think that um, uh, that the family of Catholic universities uh, has a wonderful potential. And I think um, it would be very good to think uh, in terms of, uh, of of future as to how the federation might be capable of responding to the situations like this, um, whether in terms of, um, I know, providing scholarships, for example, or, or fellowships uh, for the faculty members, or somehow finding ways just to um, share expertise with the, with the universities uh, uh, or countries which are in need. So I think that we should be really kind of thinking about those kind of structures of um, solidarity which uh, which should be global, which we should expand. And I think we should be kind of um, uh, looking ahead and forward towards the future. And that's um, that's at least kind of one lesson which we clearly have learned from our own history. Uh, and the situation with Ukraine hasn't happened overnight. It's, um, it's, uh, it's a shame that someone like Putin was uh, able for many, many years to cultivate its um, as dictatorship and uh, to the point when the whole thing eventually exploded uh, in such uh, a dramatic and horrific way. So I wish that um, we uh, as a society, as a societies or as a democracy is find a way somehow just to avoid this uh, and let this not happen in the future to any of the countries. Yeah, maybe I will add, but uh, I think we became yeah, we became too diplomatic in how we talk, how we phrase, how we do things, and uh, sometimes how we don't do things. And uh, well, as I as I said, you know, when you have enemy at your door, you you stop being diplomatic. I think we are still seeing a lot too much diplomacy and uh, unfortunately from Vatican as well. I'm talking not only for myself now, but, but for many Ukrainians who were, who are upset, honestly, you know, and um, I don't know if IFKU can do much here, but at least, you know, this support from the universities and sometimes ability to stand, um, publicly and not to be silent that that's very important and uh, sometimes you know for me it looks very strange when people um, try to to make uh, Ukrainians and Russians friends right now you know relatives or whatever this is not the time you know th there will be time for reconciliation and we will need help for that but not at this moment you know so so I'm sorry if I'm, you know, a little bit radical here, but I think this is how majority of Ukrainians feel like, and uh, and it will be a journey for us. We know it, but but there is a moment for every step in this journey, and the, this every step has to be taken at the right moment. Uh, Marie, I see that uh, you you raise your hand just before a few a few words for responding. 
um, about uh, IFCO. First, uh, we, we have opened a, a specific academic risk management program a few months ago, and we will propose a specific training session in October on this uh, topic. Uh, second point, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, there will be a specific uh, session uh, with the Ukrainian Catholic University during our next General Assembly. And I think that around you and also around other universities, I have in mind, of course, uh, the Lebanese uh, universities, who know also uh, very well this, uh, this situation in the past and uh, in a different way uh, presently. I think that uh, it would be useful for IFQ, and when I say if cool, I mean all our members, to think about uh, a kind of permanent process of solidarity. Because each time we can launch, of course, uh, some specific call for helping universities, but we need to have a permanent process so that the universities, which are members of IFCU, could know how to react, how to help concretely the concerned university. And there is also a third point uh, that uh, seems to me important. Um, you mentioned, of course, uh, the moral combat, uh, the moral fight for freedom. Uh, I think that there is perhaps also uh, another issue that, uh, that we could uh, address in the next months about uh, how we teach these uh, issues in our universities, how we teach about uh, human dignity, about uh, uh, freedom, of course, but about, uh, um, I will say, about security issues. Um, what does it mean to, 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 to teach about uh, peace security, military security, human security? So I think that we, we must have perhaps a common uh, concern and a common reflection on, this, uh, on these topics. And probably the next uh, General Assembly will be the opportunity to, to think uh, about uh, these uh, issues. Mary, excuse me for this uh, <laughs> brief uh, comment. Thank you, Francois. Um, I'm Marie Dennis. I'm not with the university. I'm with uh, Pax Christi International that has been doing uh, significant work with Catholic universities, um, uh, believing very much uh, in what you raised earlier, um, Sophia. Thank you both for, for your um, very powerful uh, presentations. Um, I was very struck by the importance that you gave to the role of Catholic universities uh, in shaping in, in a much the same way that Francois just uh, said, but in, in understanding what is security and how do we achieve security? What are the stages of conflict? How do we learn to prepare ourselves um, using the values of the Catholic uh, uh, moral teaching, how do we prepare ourselves to engage with conflict much sooner, much more deeply looking at root causes um, so that we don't come to a place uh, that is the situation of Ukraine right now where the, the tragedy of such extreme violence is, um, is enormous. Um, I, I just want to thank you for raising that uh, the importance of the role that Catholic universities can play in um, teaching the skills of both shaping our own spirituality and morality as individuals, but also in shaping uh, the moral fiber of our societies to help us move away from a logic that ends up so um, consistently in violence in a direction that would um, promote human security and nonviolence. So um, I, I wonder if the Catholic University of Ukraine uh, has traditionally had a, a component of your, of your program that focuses on um, moral, excuse me, moral and ethical education um, related to uh, violence and nonviolence, war and peace. <clears throat> uh, Any erection, Sophia? Yeah, if I may, um, just yes. a few kind of quick thoughts on this. Well, thank you, thank you very much for um, for your comment, um, with uh, with which I very much 
I think both of us uh, very much agree. I think that, um, well, you see, it, it used to be kind of economics. I mean, um, uh, at first, it, it was kind of free trade. Uh, and it seems to, it, it looked as if, um, uh, as if the, the values and virtues would simply kind of ride um, on the on the back on the shoulders of uh, free traders, uh, so there was no problem, as it seems, uh, to have this kind of free trade with Russia for for decades, eventually, and uh, and Nord Stream um, uh, two, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all that um, all that seemed to be kind of working fine. That was the kind of security which was, uh, I think, established at that time. So to the extent I can protect myself, there's not much problem in. Uh, and getting um, uh, cheaper energy or gas or something like that. Uh, and, and what we learn now, I think that the moral um, problems, they kind of fire back. I mean, maybe not immediately, but at some point um, that kind of corruption in the, uh, in the kind of broader and I think more um, deeper sense uh, of that word uh, kind of uh, evolves to destruction. So I think that's essentially what has happened uh, uh, in this case, so that um, uh, Russia was um, was kind of exporting corruption. I think that was the main export. In if, in fact, not so much oil and gas, but corruption was the main um, the main export, uh, the main Russian export. And and eventually, I mean that evolved. I mean that corruption evolved to uh, to a destruction. And I think that um, now what we are seeing, we are seeing on the surface uh, a military uh, fight. Uh, there is kind of diplomatic front, uh, which we observe, but somehow if you look deeper, it's all about kind of moral issues. Uh, and, and, and when we go through those kind of moral issues, I think we will get uh, very closely to the concepts which are at the very heart of uh, Christian thinking, like sin uh, or like uh, repentance or something like reconciliation or forgiveness. So we just kind of, we're kind of entering to this kind of very massive cluster of thinking and of acting, which I think sadly we got um, not very much used to, I think. And this is why I'm thinking that Catholic universities, they, they are very favorably positioned to build and to develop this kind of moral sensibility which this world needs, needs so much. So this is where my hope is and kind of appeal to the Catholic community. I mean, it's time, it's time to think along the kind of moral lines and kind of explore that dimension and master that dimension. And this is where security lies eventually of the future. I think that future in itself is a moral concept if, if you wish, basically it is, it is moral concept for us humans. And so this is, this, is, this is the logic we should be thinking primarily. I mean, the moral lo logic when it comes to the future and the design of uh, uh, future security architecture, democracy architecture, and all these things which we, which we used to have for granted for many, many years. Maybe I will add, you know, I recently asked Dean of the theology faculty, so how, how can Catholic universities help our theology faculty, for example, and he, the first thing which he said, we need to do more in, uh, in rethinking trauma, dealing with conflicts, and uh, dealing with military conflicts. And we didn't have enough of that because we never, you know, it was never an, such an issue for us. We were dealing with our different traumas, which we had in 20th century as a church. And I think we, you know, we moved from, from that uh, page in our history quite successfully as university and helped our nation to move from that page in the history. But if we look at the contemporary history of Ukraine, this is exactly what our theology faculty should be doing in the future and this is where you can also help a lot you know joint research teaching we are not strong in that um, and um, if you can help us with that we would really appreciate that uh, there is uh, just a very interesting comment um, that uh, taras uh, doko with a very strict uh, 
of the UCU wrote in the chat. So I invite you to to read it. Uh, I would like to add that our Polish uh, colleagues um, have also published some very interesting articles about uh, the global situation in the east part of uh, Europe and about uh, the Russian perception of, uh, of, the, of the conflict or the, also the, the global approach of international relations. Uh, Janice, I think that you raise your hand. Yes, if you can open your mic. Yes, yes you hear me. Yes, uh, I would not agree uh, that uh, uh, Vatican was doing something wrong uh, to asking uh, the lady from uh, Ukraine and uh, from Russia to uh, to do the one station of the cross uh, because uh, in in the sense of of this. Um, our faith, uh, we are brothers and sisters, even if it happens something like it happened now in, in Ukraine from the Russian side. And uh, I know the Polish people were not very happy uh, as well, but uh, the, the Pope recently, he changed a little bit his accent. And uh, personally, I think that uh, I would not, uh, I, I, am, I, I agree with him that he's trying to, to show that we should uh, Stop Russians, uh, Ukrainians, so, uh, and other uh, nations stop this war. But uh, I would like to uh, to say a few words uh, about the article which I just read today. Uh, this is the interview with uh, Viktor Yeroviev, uh, Russian's uh, writer, and uh, uh, in his opinion, uh, Russia. Uh, is not a European country. Uh, he, he, he said that we forgot about the whole history of Russia, that they are, exactly he's writing, they are white, uh, but uh, they are not uh, in the spiritual way uh, um, or civilization way um, uh, European. Uh, maybe the Russian would be not happy listening, uh, hearing this, but uh, I am thinking I am sociologist as well. I am the priest and the sociologist, and I think uh, what would happen after the war? It, it means to be completely different order uh, in, in in Europe and in in, uh, in the world, and you would have to to take this issue in in our Catholic universities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, Richard, you want to take the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Volodymyr Sofia, for your uh, testimony. I, I remain very impressed by your resilience and by your, your courage. Um, uh, I have uh, maybe three remarks at three levels. Uh, first, in relation with the, with the title of this call, it's about leadership. I understand uh, that you are uh, continuing uh, leading your university in, in these circumstances. And, and uh, in that, in a sense, uh, we have been facing uh, through the pandemic, uh, many universities have been obliged to deal with a kind of hybrid uh, uh, events and mode, mode of uh, operation. You are experiencing uh, a different type of hybridity, if I may say so. Uh, and it seems that you are planning at least to have a middle term uh, functioning like that with part of your operation, uh, teaching operation uh, being uh, still uh, at, in Lviv, but part of your faculty body, part of your students being uh, abroad. And so how, how do you want to, to deal with this hybrid, hybridity and how uh, can we help you uh, to, uh, to, to sustain it, uh, to avoid, let's say, the, <laughs> the evaporation of the university in such a, such a case. The second level maybe connected is uh, the role of uh, IFCU, of the Catholic University. Um, indeed, in, in this context, uh, there is a single solidarity and, and a lot of support, I know already. Uh, but uh, especially in this model of hybridity, and if you would imagine that part of 
your students uh, going by groups, maybe being uh, uh, welcome in one particular place or, or in different places, but how could the community be extended, so to say, the, the university community be, be uh, making use of the IFCO community to, to be strengthened at least. Another aspect I was thinking, <laughs> what you said, Volodymyr, of the just-in-case preparation, I think it could be integrated maybe in the IFCO um, leadership uh, formation. <laughs> maybe it would be an interesting uh, case study, just-in-case uh, for the next rectors, the next generation, if something happened like that. And the third level is a more theoretical knowledge development. So. Uh, uh, of course, uh, Sofia, you mentioned service learning, uh, but I think it's a, it's interesting uh, stimulation because the war, as you say, is a, a revelation of uh, the real face. So there is no no longer gray. It's a bit black and white, and it's maybe obliged. Uh, we are obliged to do so. Um, Usually the academia is a is a gray world because we have a lot of nuance and but now we are obliged and uh, so but it's maybe a, a stimulation for us to think both on specific pedagogy but also specific methodology uh, to develop uh, research in, in a in a constant fact check with reality and not um, yeah not being blended by by. A, <laughs> virtual virtual facts so to say so and and this could be linked to to what Tara such as put in the call so this three level maybe leadership um, community global community and more knowledge level thank you <laughs> you want to start <laughs> so maybe i start this time so um yeah well uh COVID was a great test drive for us, you know, if, if there was no COVID, we would be completely lost, I think, uh, in the, in some, in many ways. So we, we learned a lot uh, through COVID and which, which is being used right now. And, uh, you know, that no matter where your students or faculty is, they are still your students and your faculty. So about uh, this hybridity, well, we would like to bring it uh, less, you know, be a community university and every every single person is saying you know that we are community university so of course uh, as soon as we can have it less we would like to have it less but uh, at the same time i think it will be there uh, to set an extent you know because um, you know even having just to give you an example, we are having not only undergraduate full time students, but we have a lot of executive students. And at this moment, uh, all of them are not only studying, but they are running businesses, which is crucial for the country. And uh, they are volunteering and helping the country and uh, they cannot come in the in the in the regular mode how they have been studying for uh, for last years, they cannot do that, but but we as the university can serve them and we can become a platform. So we, th I think we are thinking of ourselves as a platform more um, where no matter what type and format of meeting happens, that it helps our students. And, uh, and in that sense, you know, it, it's a safe place for community. It's a safe place for reflection for uh, which which they definitely need to do a lot and um, and uh, if I may get to this the third level of knowledge you know which you have mentioned um, I, I I think we as a university we have to reflect ourselves because you know we are in the 24 7 mode for 20 for 54 days we didn't have days off um, we didn't have Easter vacations, we have land, but uh, if you ask how much people sleep, they don't sleep much still even right now. And uh, sometimes because they cannot sleep uh, because of anxiety, sometimes because they have to go to the shelter twice per night or three times per night. And, uh, and it's all, everything, you know, it, it, all of that has to, it has to come down, but we just don't see the end at the moment. So. Um, so I take your your thoughts more as an input for us, you know, how we can take it into future. If if I may, if I may yeah, kind of add and follow up on this, what uh, what Sophia has mentioned. Well, I think that um, 
it's kind of real um, problem and, and scandal, if you wish, to have a war like this uh, in the middle of Europe in the 21st century. So um, supposedly some things went wrong. Uh, and, I think, um, and I think that there's got to be a lot of kind of rethinking uh, going on, uh, and also in terms of academia and, and, and research, et cetera, et cetera. Some, something wasn't functioning properly if something like this, of this scale, of this magnitude has happened. So I can imagine that this is, um, that this is uh, one of the major goals and challenges to see how academia could be um, playing its role in, um, uh, in the future, given this experience we're going through, um, all of us together, the whole kind of Western and European world. And the second thing is that I think um, there are many things uncertain uh, now, but, uh, but what it is certain that uh, it probably take many years to rebuild the country. Uh, well, I know it might be a, as many as 10 years at least just to kind of get the country rebuilt. Sophia has mentioned that the estimates are that, uh, that the damage uh, we have now is somewhere between, um, I know, uh, $250 billion to $500 billion. And I think, I think these are just money to rebuild kind of the country or build the buildings. I mean, there is nothing about kind of investments, et cetera, et cetera. You would need probably much more. So this is, I think we are really somewhere in a trillion uh, of money needed just to kind of reboost or restart uh, uh, the, the economy of the country. So this is one major challenge. I mean, it's like, it's immense. Um, it's immense. In many regards, I think it's kind of unprecedented uh, in the very recent uh, history, I believe. And then it's also clear that we should be kind of building, designing, developing a new uh, security uh, system. I mean, the old one we used to have, we thought we had it, it failed. It will take time. It will take, it's also kind of a generational effort. You just can build that infrastructure in a year or something like that. This is about kind of, it's about people, it's about attitudes, it's about virtues, it's about mentality of people um, and many other things. I mean, there's also economy, military part of that, diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a massive, massive effort and a massive undertaking, I think. And a third component of that, of that future is Russia itself. And, um, we don't know what's going to happen with Russia, but the thing is that um, if even if everything goes relatively well, so to speak, there is a huge inertia, or will be a huge inertia in, in the people's kind of thinking, uh, way of looking at things and the kind of values and the kind of social habits and social reflexes and social attitudes. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult even to imagine the amount of lying and falsification which was kind of um, thrown at the people. And this was going on for generations. Uh, one, of the, one of the kind of, um, uh, I think, causes and reasons of the present situation is in fact the fact that, that communism itself was, was never kind of brought to the court, if I can put it this way, in the way Nazi was. So somehow what has happened these days that the communist part was very much kind of integrated, camouflaged, and kind of embedded in the Russian world concept. So this is this is in fact what has happened, and so that 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 kind of trauma uh, is still um, is still uh, not being cured. So it goes for generations, for generations and generations. This I think why we should be kind of uh, very very serious with uh, moral and immoral things. Uh, they just um, they just fire back in one way or another. So the Russia is going to be a huge, a huge challenge, a huge problem in terms of kind of disenchanting the people, in terms of uh, changing their values, their way of looking at the, uh, at the world and changing their political system. So these three things, I mean, they're kind of very, very certain from my viewpoint, uh, though it's kind of very uncertain at this point as to how we should be dealing with uh, uh, all three of them at the same time. Thank you. I think that John, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I think um, uh, I'd like to join in expressing the 
uh, admiration which we all feel for the leaders of the universities in Ukraine, which has been quite amazing. And uh, uh, trying to cope with the sort of problems which we uh, in other countries would not have any experience about at all. And I think we are, you know, very, very uh, um, uh, much in admiration of what you've been able to do. <clears throat> I was particularly taken by um, the point which uh, both uh, Sophia and Volodymyr mentioned about there being possibly two stages, you know, from now on. I mean, one is obviously coping as well we can with the existing situation, but the second might very well be to uh, begin to figure through what the role of universities might be in Ukraine after uh, we uh, won the war, as you uh, very uh, well, well put it, Sophia. Um, and this is, I suppose, about reconstruction. It's about uh, solidarity. It's about preventing as far as we can uh, repetitions of what's been going on. And it's about strengthening society as well. And uh, I, I guess looking at other parts of the world which have been in similar, but not by any means as serious situations as you've found yourself in, it's possible to see the way in which universities have tended to evolve the model of how uh, they conceive themselves and the model of how they behave, what they actually do, and particularly what they do in relation to the society in which they find themselves. Uh, and it's very much, I suppose, about reconfiguration of the services to society which uh, universities may offer, uh, both in, in general terms um, and in, in terms of the Im, Im, imparting of civilized values. It's about societal cohesion. Uh, it's about economic regeneration. And it's also, of course, about um, individuals taking them to a far higher level of intellectual appreciation uh, in a practical sort of sense, if you like, than maybe has been the case before. So I suppose in some ways this, this probably might mean having a much wider range of clientele in the university of the future uh, than we might have at the present time. And I, th I think it's been very interesting the way in which the discussion has taken place because I, th I think various of our colleagues have said, well, clearly uh, what we do in terms of moral education for society, ethical education for society, the implantation of values is very important. And I guess here, this question of you know peace studies, reconciliation studies come in here, but also I think an awareness of strategic studies as well, which has become very much uh, you know to the fore in the last uh, last months or so. Uh, I was very impressed as well with what was said earlier on. Uh, which is have the universities now got a, a major role to play in training societal leaders for the reconstruction of the society, which of course has been badly damaged and the economy, which has been badly damaged as well. Um, and I think this is a, seems to be a huge sort of role for Catholic universities to play in this respect. Um, I think has also been mentioned the question of how we can assist in the university, um, Hero University and other universities in Ukraine in terms of uh, uh, regional uh, civic and um, uh, physical reconstruction, economic reconstruction as well. Um, and to, to that extent, of course, uh, a lot of the things which we are about, a lot of the problems which we've been talking about uh, are not single discipline problems in terms of an understanding of them, they are very much multidisciplinary in nature. So the question is, of course, how we might help, uh, you know, provide a more multidisciplinary uh, form of assistance to uh, the universities in that particular way. And it may be, of course, that some of the disciplines which the society needs, your universities have not got as Catholic universities, other universities might have. So I suppose inevitably, uh, as you rightly pointed out, we're into the business of partnerships. And I suppose partnerships as well will very much involve us as uh, international uh, universities being involved 
and helping you in international partnerships in all the sort of domains uh, which Volodymyr uh, had mentioned um, as well. And of course, partnerships bring with them the opportunity of increasing um, your own staff capacity by accessing colleagues from other universities to work with your own colleagues in terms of the sort of issues which we've been talking about. And um, finally, of course, we've got here the question of uh, flexible uh, uh, learning processes, flexible pedagogies, action learning, which is geared up towards societal needs rather than just the academic discipline, which, uh, of course, underpins uh, what we've been uh, doing. So I, I, I think my um, sort of f feeling is that uh, one of the things which we can perhaps as a, as a collective uh, of uh, fellow universities begin to do is to think through with you what the future uh, uh, nature of the university might be uh, and how we can help you know uh, you get to the stage where you want to be by a host of various things I think which uh, we might be able to be of assistance with but thank you very much indeed for the presentation it's been a very inspiring thank you very much Thank you, John. Sofia or Vladimir, would you like to? This is, I, just, I just want to thank. This is a very rich and deep uh, set of comments um, uh, with which uh, we um, with which we agree. Uh, I may only add that uh, I think this is a unique opportunity also for for you and your universities and your faculty to start kind of doing things and designing courses and adjusting courses and kind of experimenting with the courses. So if you have a little time while we fight just to do something and develop something. And we'd be happy just to pick up whatever you develop in the meantime. Uh, we'll be hungry for that kind of stuff uh, inevitably. So, so it's, um, it's good to be in the center of your kind of focus and intention. Um, but I would also advise, um, uh, think of this as an opportunity to start uh, quickly kind of redesigning, rethinking, upgrading uh, your classes, your topics, your fields, your interdisciplinary kind of um, approaches to uh, that you used to have um, in view of this situation and the massive, massive challenges which we will be as the kind of Western world facing in the years to come. There is not much time actually just to move fast and forward. So I would encourage you to do this um, uh, as well. And that would be a great help to us, by the way. We'll, we'll be happy to join you as soon as we would be able to do so. Thank you, Vladimir. Sofia, would you like to add a comment or a few words? No. I don't see any other hand. So I think that we are at the end anyway of our webinar. Um, There's France, France. I don't see him, perhaps it is enough. So I give you the floor. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I just, I'm in Macau in China. I just returned from Austria, Vienna. I met many, many families with children uh, one week ago in, in the railway station uh, in Vienna. I, I would just support this, this argument, how can we overcome blindness, this academic blindness? Because uh, this was in the making for 22 years. I was aware of Georgia and the game and, and, and Moldavia, this, this issue, but not, I was not aware that Putin came into power by a terror plot, where, where two, two, 300 people were killed. I was not aware of this, actually. How can we overcome this blindness in the academic field? Or I think we need much more collaboration uh, on, on, the, on the staff level, but also in the, in the, in the class, in the lectures, in the syllabi and so. I have one question. Uh, because um, I think Putin follows here his political agenda, but we hear always this argument, uh, him, of that to save Russia and Ukraine from, uh, from the decadent West. And one example comes up, like the gay culture is threatening or dissolving the traditional family. How do you, what do you say in, in, in Ukraine to this argument? Is this a fake, is this a tool, uh, or uh, how can we address this? Uh, 
uh, yeah, I think, well, just, just look at Putin himself and the kind of traditional family that he has and, uh, and cherishes himself. And, um, and he's, uh, he's a prince of, of lying, lying himself. So I think this is, uh, I, as a matter of fact, I wouldn't take seriously any single word spoken by Putin at this, at this point. It's, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's kind of saving Ukrainians by killing Ukrainians. Um, he's, he's saying that the Ukrainians, they have no right to exist. On the one hand, at the same time, he says, I'm here in this country to save Ukrainians from Nazis. Okay, well, I'm, 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 I'm willing to save Russian speaking people uh, in the whole world and the cities which he has bombarded heavily. Mariupol is 95% destroyed city. I mean, it's like non-existent completely. It was, uh, it was almost 100% Russian speaking people, I mean, they, they would also speak Ukrainian basically, but the thing was that the kind of the, 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 their kind of language which they would use at home, it was a Russian, uh, Russian language. So, I mean, this is, this is impossible to imagine. I mean, you say I'm here to protect Russian culture and I'm sending missiles just to kind of annihilate people who, uh, who have at least some kind of cultural uh, adherence um, to that Russian language, Russian culture, whatever that means. So, I mean, it's a, it's an unimaginable amount of lie and lying uh, which we uh, which we see here. I mean, an imaginable amount of kind of hypocrisy which is present here, and kind of very incredible effort of simply kind of putting um, truths, kind of bracketing truths at all. I mean, just kind of getting rid of truth as a phenomenon. So that's, that's what has uh, happened with Putin. So I would be very cautious to put it mindly in kind of taking seriously and having any kind of academic discussion or dialogue with Putin, trying to find some kind of uh, argument and some kind of reason behind that. It's, um, it's very diabolical. I think at least in this kind of uh, group of people, I could kind of, uh, really mean this and say this, and you would get this point. It is diabolical. Thank you for this clarification. Thank you. I will maybe just add that I think Ukrainians, we are now looking not for words, but we are looking for actions of people. And people can talk a lot, but, but I see actions. I see people who leave their businesses and go to territory defense defense or military to fight for the country um, I see students who don't sleep for months and help and uh, you know just are committed I see you know I see people who try to take care at least of their families but at the same time they are hosting you know 10 other people in their houses I see I see many evidence of action, and uh, I would not, you know, I would not follow separate words of the person who is at the same time saying a lot but doing completely different. Um, Sofia and Vladimir, you have a very concrete question, two concrete questions in the chat. Uh, the first one do you have opportunities for students to connect with yours, Zoom gatherings? How could we facilitate this or be part of them? And there is also another question of, about uh, classes on Zoom. So I don't know if you can answer these questions now. Anyway, uh, for the attendees, if you have some other questions, you can send, us, uh, send them to us. And uh, of course, we will share your questions with uh, Vladimir and Sofia after this uh, webinar. Yeah, that would be actually if you have questions or suggestions or you're ready to connect, it would be great if, if we could uh, do that after webinar. And uh, I would just maybe make a short remark that we try to connect our students with, uh, with foreign uh, um, universities, other international groups of students and to universities. I had very good experience, you know, when my students spoke to their peers from the University of Notre Dame and their students said, 
you know, we could not imagine that our fellow fellows uh, of the same age could go like you are going through not only you know war and what happens but at the same time you study you live you you volunteer you you know it was i think it was very change you know a, a paradigm shift for for young people on both sides so so it's very good idea and we try to do it as much as possible so we are open for that and if I can add, uh, I think that we addressed some very important questions, uh, not only for, for now, but also for, for the future, as it, as it has been uh, mentioned. And so if uh, some of you are interested uh, in being part of a working group uh, for uh, thinking about these, uh, these issues, concrete issues, but also some uh, other about what, uh, how can we teach about uh, security. Uh, uh, I think that uh, this uh, situation, uh, that is a, which is a dramatic situation, is also the opportunity for thinking about uh, what we we call uh, the social responsibility of our university. So about all these uh, topics, we have four months before the next General Assembly, and it could be interested uh, to create uh, a working group and uh, as you know we have also a specific um, foresight department and so it could be also helpful to to work in, in this uh, in such a group so if some of you are interested you can uh, send uh, your, uh, your your name or your interest to to Loic and then we will create with uh, Sofia Vladimir Taras a specific group for uh, continuing this uh, common reflection. I don't see any other question. So I think that uh, to the end of our webinar. So I would like to thank you, uh, Sofia and Vladimir, for sharing your thoughts with, with us. It was a very very interesting and uh, I think fruitful for uh, all of us. And uh, anyway, we will organize with you in the very next uh, future some other webinars. So thank you. Thank you to the attendees. Thank you to all of you for the, your presence. Bye.